Uh, first of all, I, I had just a couple, just one or two points. I wanted after yesterday's tutorial, which I had just uh, popped in and saw what was going on. Um, I think uh, in the second question, the first part was part A was um, actually what I really want. What else? What I wanted uh, was that um, there's a sentence here. It says the insertion. This is in the this is the rubber band uh, equation. Of the equation. These are the equations of state of the rubber band. It says here uh, the insertion of the factor t in this equation is dictated by the thermodynamic conditions of consistency of the two equations of state. That is, as in equation 346, blah blah. This derivative has to equal this derivative. And what I really meant was verify that this is true given these equations of state. What that means is you're not told that, uh, assume that that, the, that these need to be checked for consistency. That's what I meant. Okay? Um, obviously, if they're correct, then this must hold. Um, but, okay, then, then uh, a few minutes later, somebody asked, um, um, why I think it was something like why is that it, why can you have d2s by dl um, du uh, sorry du by det equal to d2s by dt du why why is that so because it's um, second assuming c c2 c2 yeah okay yeah but why 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 is the entropy because D and U are twice the the differential. Because they're both wildly twice the differential. Okay. Mm. The reason is that it comes from the, the, the basic equation in thermodynamics is 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 this one, right? Um, and so 1 on TDU um, plus P on TDV and say other things over here. This is the basic equation. Um, so these are differentials. This means you talk about small changes. So in thermodynamics, all the, the, the foundation of the basis, the foundation of the thermodynamics is built up uh, from very small changes, small enough changes so that, so that this is true. Now, why, why is this so? The reason is that this is a total derivative. If this is a total derivative, it means that, that you can integrate the S from some S naught to some S uh, to give some, some final, to give um, um, some, some, fi some um, S at a final state minus S at the initial state. In the final conditions, the initial conditions. And so that gives you an entropy function. So the fact that this is a total derivative is what makes this true. And then that uh, is, uh, that just kind of follows. Um, um, I, there was a theory that I mentioned in, uh, in uh, the third lecture. Okay, well that, that follows, but the basic point is that this is a total derivative. Uh, that's, so, that's where that comes from. But the basic, but even more fundamental is that ds is not what's the first thing that's defined. You've got dq. In fact, dq is not the first thing that's defined in the theory. It's, uh, you know, du and dw, and you know how to measure du, how to measure u's and du's using adiabatic processes. And Quasi static and not back to processes and one irreversible process. Right. And then DQ, the heat is defined as the difference between that and that, but that's the work done on the system and that's the change in internal energy of the system. And then it just so happens that um, T times DQ makes that into a total di differential DS. I didn't actually prove that, but. Um, not that hard. So, and so that's why DS is a total differential, 
And that's why um, ultimately you can take these cross derivatives and why you must have the, soft, the consistency test between the equations of state. Because the consistency test between the equation of state is just a statement between second derivatives. Okay. First, I don't understand how the exact derivative thing leads to the sec that the second derivative is. Read, read lecture three. Okay. So it's the, the, it's a sequence of two or three theorems. I didn't mention any more details. Okay. Um, so, uh, so that's that. Okay, so today it's, um, I want to talk about the physical, uh, first of all, why the potentials uh, that, that we learned about last week uh, are useful. So last week we did Legendre transform representations um, of the internal, of, of, um, of uh, thermodynamics. And so uh, from the internal energy, uh, we found we found by substituting, uh, by, we found out how to swap, um, say, the entropy variable for temperature, um, the volume var variable for um, the, the pressure, and, and so on. Um, why are these functions that we get in that way useful? And what's their physical meaning? So I'll answer that today. This is a first look, it's, it's a very important look, first look. We, it's actually important that we, what we do today. Um, and it's one of these things that you can remember forever. You don't need to change it no matter how advanced the physics is that you learn. This is something that's always, that will always be true. Einstein said that, or believed that thermodynamics would be one theory that would never be overturned. So, you know, this is one of these things that, that that you can just remember forever that we learned today. But when we learn statistical, begin statistical mechanics in a few weeks' time, uh, you'll see um, more interpretations and useful insights about these functions. Just a brief section on how to measure entropy. The main point of this section uh, is um, uh, actually partly technical and partly how to measure the entropy. There are a couple of technical points that um, um, that I want to introduce you to are uh, manipulations that are typical in thermodynamics and you would be using those over and over again uh, even in this course and in SP3 so you might so uh, I'll, I'll introduce them possibly for the first time here and finally um, applications of these of the potentials now these potentials are are most useful when one or more of the natural variables are under control in the experiment. I'll try to convey why. And um, we'll look at one specific example, how to liquefy air um, or liquefy helium, um, basically many gases. And uh, it's called throttling, throttling um, or the Joule Thompson process. And throttling means pushing something through a narrow constriction. It's like um, you throttle your little brother, you know, like this, you grab your neck and you go, and that's throttling. It's an easy joke. You don't really do that, do you? Okay, and next week we'll see more applications. Okay, and that's, uh, ne next week we'll see maybe uh, the three or four really typical applications for some of the other. Uh, thermodynamic potentials. Okay. So, uh, just as an outline and orientation for the first part, and uh, it's something that we need to keep in mind for um, the next I don't know, hour or so. So, um, what we're doing is we, up until now, we have been considering an isolated system. Okay, and the isolated system may have had several subsystems. Um, it could have had a hot body, cold body, and some reversible work source. Uh, it could have um, been partitioned into any number of subsystems. But this time, what we're going to look at is specifically the case where, uh, no, it's not a case, this is really uh, 
an abstract model for uh, for reality, and many you know, you know, th these kind of situations are ubiquitous. This is one of the main reasons why thermodynamics is so useful, uh, you know, for for predicting results of chemistry experiments done in the lab or uh, or whatever. These are these this, this is a, an abstract diagram of something that's ubiquitous. So the typical situation and what we're considering is an isolated system that's being partitioned like this. You have some kind of reservoir here, and this could be a heat reservoir, or it could be a heat reservoir and a pressure reservoir, or it could be heat reservoir, pressure, pressure reservoir, and a particle reservoir, or any permutation of those, or it could be something else. It could be a chemical potential reservoir that allows particles to, to flow. Then, and here, and you've got some kind of um, partition between the reservoir and the, there's a, a, like a single composite subsystem here that's divided into two, subsystem one and subsystem two. And, and there's a wall between these two like this and there's a partition between the reservoir and these two subsystems like this. Right. Now, this partition here and this partition here has different properties uh, depending on the particular situation that you're doing. Okay? So, for example, this can be a heat reservoir, and then what this arrow represents is heat being exchanged between the subsystem and the reservoir, and vice versa. And this subsystem and this sub and this reservoir are the reservoir up here. So um, that's that would represent heat flow. Um, in the first example that we'll look at, uh, this will, this partition will be movable, but impermeable, and also uh, we will not let heat through. So it will be adiabatic, but we'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes. So this is the, the more or less. Um, Every realistic system that you can possibly consider um, is somehow contained in this. If you take into account that um, you, this, these subsystems may be subpartitioned into many others, and all sorts of permutations and uh, are possible. Um, so, uh, in each case, now the point is that in each case we begin the thermodynamic description by including the, the reservoir and subsystem variables. All right, so you'll begin by, by noting, by, by, by focusing attention on the, entire on the entire isolated system. And so we consider the variables from each of the um, reservoir and the two subsystems, everything that's in there. And except what you'll see is that uh, the mathematics will show us that the final equilibrium condition or conditions for the subsystems, and in the end we're interested only in, 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 in the subsystems. We'll forget the reservoir, only interested in the subsystems. We'll see that the mathematics shows us, it guides us, um, and it tells us that the final equilibrium conditions for these two subsystems here can be described entirely in terms of variables that, that uh, come that describe these two subsystems and not anything else in the, in the, in the rest of the isolated system. So, uh, as long as we minimize the appropriate thermodynamic potential, or we consider it to be minimized. Right? So any particular uh, realization of this situation will lead to some kind of thermodynamic potential and that, at the minimum of that thermodynamic potential, uh, describes or gives you the equilibrium conditions between the subsystems here. And then after you do that, it means that if you, you do not need to concentrate or further consider the entire subsystem, the entire isolated system, you just consider, you just focus on the particular subsystem that, you look, that you're concerned with. So for example, if you do a chemistry experiment in, in the lab, so with a Bunsen burner or something, whatever, people do in chemistry. Um, so <laughs> um, um, the, the, the lab laboratory uh, air um, provides a pressure, provides fixed pressure and temperature, uh, like a temperature bath, temper air and pressure bath, if you like. 
and that that is constant no matter what happens to the sample in the in the chemical chemistry experiment. Okay, so in that case, uh, you know, in that sort of situation, you don't want to describe the the, the entire laboratory, the air in the laboratory, and everything. Um, you, the conditions of it, all you want to do is focus on the uh, experiment that you're doing and um, you know, forget everything else. And as long as you choose the correct thermodynamic potential, then you can do that. That's not to say that you, you can't use other potentials. Yes, you, indeed you can. But what will turn, what will happen is that you will need another, the other, the other potential plus one or two equations of state then you have to mess around changing variables in your fundamental relation. Okay? Whereas if you choose the correct or the most appropriate potential, correct is the wrong word, but the most appropriate potential um, first off, then the, your equations turn out a lot easier and you, you, you've got a lot less work to do. Okay? <clears throat> so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the picture. Um, so... Uh, so the first thing, uh, first example is we're going to consider a composite system. Uh, here's the composite system in contact with a thermal reservoir only, and you know, have to take care uh, with what the actual partitions um, are. Uh, so the, the the partition between the heat reservoir and this this entire subsystem here only lets heat through. Okay. Uh, it's rigid and impermeable and only lets heat through. Okay. Um, now, the partition between the subsystems is movable, right? but it's insulated and we'll say that it's also impermeable. Okay. So all it does is, is, is allow an exchange of volume between the subsystems, like that. Okay, is that clear? That's, that's the starting point. All right, so let's write down um, what we know. So, um, so what we know is that um, we know the total energy. Is U total. Um, now U is the energy of the entire subsystem, and U superscript R is the energy of the reservoir. And but by, by conservation of energy, because this, the entire uh, the entire system is isolated, it must be constant. And then also the total volume. Um, is the volume of the subsystem plus the volume of the reservoir that equals constant. But also because um, because uh, the partition between the heat reservoir and the subsystems is, is rigid, then it really, uh, we don't need to keep that in the equation. In fact, V is V of system 1 plus V of system 2. Now, they can have any combination as long as their sum is a constant and it equals the total volume of the, of the system. So, this is um, exchange of volume. So, we don't really need this equation there, but we, this one here is the important one. So exchange of volume between the subsystems and then now all partitions are impermeable So that means uh, now we don't know how we don't care about how many moles <coughs> the um, reservoir has, but 
uh, it's really the subsystems that we're interested in. Uh, so N1 is constant and N N2 equals constant. <coughs> and the equilibrium state of the isolated system is determined by <coughs> by the energy minimum principle so we have um, du total equals zero so we're starting from the view of the entire isolated system okay so now du total is du plus dur and D, du is just the sum of the energies of the subsystems so this is just by definition and at minimum uh, that's going to be zero and also, also have we, it has to be concave up, so D2U total uh, must be positive. So that's the uh, minimum condition. And this is not enough by itself. So the, the energy minimum condition is not enough by itself. We need uh, one more equation. And it's the restriction on the entropy. And so the, the restriction on the entropy is that the total entropy which is the entropy of the subsystem plus the entropy of the reservoir um, which is again S1 plus S2 plus the entropy of the reservoir that has to equal constant and that's the maximum possible max entropy um, possible um, given the um, parameters so so um, that there, by the way, uh, means that S total is, uh, DS total is um, DS plus SR, and, um, and that has to equal zero. So that means that the um, change in the infinitesimal change in uh, entropy of the reservoir is minus ds so that's going to be important so whatever whatever entropy the reservoir loses as long as the process is quasi static um, the uh, that, that is gained by the um, the subsystem why is it S constant? Um, because um, in equilibrium, in equilibrium. Mm -hmm. that's this at the equilibrium state <coughs> here. But the equilibrium state, we know it's constant because it's an equilibrium. But isn't the the the, the main factor that the S is equal to zero? That's what we're running into, right? But it's basically, we're, we're not saying it's constant, we're saying that it's constant at a minimum. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, at the minimum of the, 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 the equilibrium state. Or at the maximum, sorry. That S is constant, but at the maximum. And that it's the mm -hmm. maximum that matters, not the, yeah, not yeah. the constant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Huh. And, Professor, isn't the oh. energy minimum? And the energy max uh, and the entropy maximum. The same thing. The same thing. Because we derived this from this. Uh, yeah, but we want to uh, uh, focus on the energy minimum view. So they're not the same thing, really. But they're, they're kind of they're, they're duals of each other. So uh, this is uh, so it's energy minimum subject to that or entropy maximum subject to um, constant 
you because yeah. but you say D U total is zero. Mm. Uh, don't you mean just conservation of energy in general rather than the U minimum principle? Energy minimum principle. Um, no, this is saying something else. Uh, what that derivation last week said was that if you have uh, if you have the system, here's the energy of the system, and it's all oh, it's at a minimum. Yeah, then if you uh, vary uh, what's called a virtual um, virtual change in energy, virtual change in any direction. Um, then, um, in, in any, but it, actually, it, in thermodynamics, you don't look at, uh, in thermodynamics, in equilibrium thermodynamics, um, um, we do talk about fluctuations, but that's later on, and that's what is a fluctuation made of. It's, it's really like a temporary imbalance in some local, some local imbalance in pressure or, or temperature, and it causes a small deviation from the minimum um, in the energy. And so the, so the system's actually exploring states that are close to the minimum. And, and what, what this is saying, and it, it, since it's ex exploring these, this is not necessarily conservation of energy principle is really saying that it's exploring minima. Um, the energy mathematics that was like yeah, uh, uh, actually, actually actually um, so there would be a difference between it can't be fluctuating if it's an isolated system. Yes actually let me let me retract that. It can't be fluctuating if it's an isolated system but what's happening is what can happen is you can imagine a, a, what's called a, a virtual uh, change in, in energy, uh, which is kind of like imaginary. Imagine if it was a slightly different, if it was a slightly different system with a slightly different energy, mm -hmm. like that. And but you um, you consider these virtual displacements, of, if you like, of energy at the same maximum entropy. Right. So that's that's the. That's the difference. It's not. A, it's not the fact that uh, the total energy is constant, and therefore du is zero. It's the fact that under virtual displacement of the energy, um, virtual change in energy, uh, this is a minimum. So, so basically, although it looks as if we're talking about the the, the total energy, mm -hmm. what we what we're trying to understand is the coach. Exactly. That's a really good way of putting it. So maybe yeah. we have uh, one conservation law and one maximum max or min law. Yeah. It's either we speak about conservation of energy and maximization of entropy, or we speak about conservation of entropy and minimization of energy. It's not really conservation of entropy. Uh, entropy is a quantity that is always maximized in a system in equilibrium given the constraints of the system. So at that. So it's it's it's. Maximum entropy and conservation of energy, or minimum energy and still maximum entropy at that at those conditions. Okay. So, um, so the basic point is that entropy is as large as possible. under the given conditions. And okay. Yep. What about the curvature? We never actually tested the curvature. Did for you? Yes, we did. For S. Oh, no. That's, um, uh, that's a postulate. That doesn't come from thermodynamics. Oh. I don't think thermodynamics can give you uh, the maximum entropy condition. 
But we never, uh, as in check that we always equate DS to zero. Whenever in the did. proof last week, we went um, maximum entropy implies yeah, the yeah. curvature of U, yeah. but we omitted the, 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 the other way, and you could have done it. But uh, I mean, when we when we explore a system that is is going to equilibrium, and we 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 want to find the equilibrium state, we always write that DS is equal to zero, mm -hmm. which is an an experiment but not necessarily a maximum or a minimum, and we never tested the second. There's because we don't need it possible. We don't need it until uh, stability, until consider the stability of the system, which is, we, we do that next semester. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, then this is all assuming quasi-static processes. It's actually, this is a very important point. Okay. All right, so, um, so now the U total is zero. Now, um, by the energy minimum principle. And so that means that we have DU1 plus DU2 plus du r equals zero. And now, what's du one? Well, du one consists of the heat that's transferred into system one minus the, the work done on system one by the other system. And then, in general, there might be some Actually, I said it's impermeable before, but you don't you don't need to make it. Oh, actually, in general, it's this. Okay, in general, so may as well write the general case. And for system two, it's um, it gets a certain amount of heat from the heat reservoir. Oops, two. And has work done on it by the second uh, by the, by the other subsystem. And it has a certain chemical potential and a certain um, change in number of particles. And then there's here plus DUR, and all that equals zero. Now if you notice that these quantities here These are, um, you got only due to exchanges between the subsystems. Whereas these quantities here, These involve only exchanges between the uh, heat reservoir and subsystem. Now, V1 and V2 uh, and, NK, uh, and the NK1 and NK2 are independent variables and all this equals zero which means that P1 must equal P2 in equilibrium. So the argument is that V1, V2, NK1, NK2 are independent variables Therefore, is yeah. V2 dependent on V1 because yeah. it's uh, 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 uh. 
Um, V2 is minus zero. It's yeah, 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 yeah. Or one of them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. True. So, so nk, one k, two independent variables. Um, therefore, n k one. Actually, this is not true. It's just that the change is zero. Actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. The change is zero. Of number yeah, because because um, now because the variable is dnk i equals zero uh, because the walls are impermeable. All the walls impermeable. We just don't want to consider them here, and we know um, that dv two equals minus dv1, therefore p2 equals p1 in equilibrium. Um, and so, so all, um, all the quantities in, in the, like the big rectangular box equal r0. So the quantities in a sum to zero, right? And so all we have left, so only have, therefore only have T1 DS1 plus T2 DS2 plus D U R equals zero. Uh, yep. We could have had that D V is equal to minus D V one. D V two is equal to minus D V one. But mm -hmm. the pressures are not equal and they're and they're created by the D S um, except that Or is it because D V one equals minus D V two from the t conservation because the total volume of the subsystem is constant. Yeah, but even if we had that we could have said that they result in a certain change, which is balanced by a change in TDS or the DU, the other DU terms. That's a yeah, um, but that's that's uh, obviously if you compress, say if this gas compresses that one and heats it up, then some heat flows uh, it raises the temperature yeah. above TR, then some heat flows that way. And balances out the pressure. That's that's the mechanism. That's how it works. But the mathematics is more direct. But it's telling it's telling us that it's telling us that dv two is minus dv one, and so that's why that's why um, p one equals p two. But how does that imply that my, how does because the only volume exchange is happening between the subsystems and not with the reservoir? But there's also a temperature. Mm. So why can't the temperature exchanges balance the volume exchanges? Uh, pressure, uh, pressure exchanges for like, that, that there's, there's no pressure exchange. It's a, it's a volume exchange. So why can't the TDS terms balance the DV terms? Um, because these are independent variables. But as you said, when you compress the gas, mm. because of that, some of the heat flow happens. Mm. So doesn't that sort of mean that they are dependent? Um, what it's saying is that. Uh, uh, no, they're definitely not dependent. Just, uh, I mean, everything has an effect on everything else. It's just that you're you're choosing a set of independent variables to describe it. So in this case, which one? Well, um, V1, V2, S1, S2, etc. Yeah. Uh, so basically, it has to be, uh, uh, it has to be zero. The D terms have to be zero. Yeah, because the only volume exchange is between the two subsystems. Yeah. Yeah. And and that immediately gives us that, and that has to equal zero. And and that doesn't play any role, doesn't affect any of this because these are independent variables. 
So S and D are independent. That's why this is the energy representation, and the variables are S1, S2, V1, V2, and, it's, and, the, ref, and the ones for the uh, reservoir. Okay, um, but now, so that's just T1, DS1 plus T2, DS2 minus TR, DSR. That's TR, DSR, but I may as well just write, um, just, sorry, plus TR, DSR, zero. So that's, um, now since DS2 is minus DS1, what was that? Uh, no. Uh, no. DS1 plus DS2 is equal to minus DS1. DSR is which? What do we get? Yeah, what do we have before? DSR is equal to negative DS1 minus DS2. Right, there it is there. Okay, so, so that's um, T1 um, minus T2. Hang on a sec. Oh, no, no, no. Um, I think DSR. 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 Yes. Um. Um. Huh? I think you're facing the DSR. 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 Yeah. yeah. S1 and S2 are independent variables, it means that the coefficient must be zero. So we can say S1 and S2 are independent because this heat, like the wall is it doesn't exchange heat. Yes, because it doesn't exchange heat. So that's that's the reason why we made this an, an insulating wall. So, so that means that so the heat reservoir and I drop this out. So the heat reservoir controls the temperature of the subsystem in the two controls the temperature of the subsystem and its two sort of sub subsystems. Okay. Now the energy minimum principle, which is uh, du total equals zero and it's concave up, but we're not going to use that. So there's du total. So the linearity is that and that's that's a plus. Okay, you can change it to plus because the change 
in the total um, energy, which is a virtual change. It's, it's not a real change because the system is isolated. You can't, the, 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 the energy doesn't, of the isolated system doesn't change, it's fixed. But you're imagining small uh, isolated systems that are close in size to this one and have slightly different energies. In that case, and then so you're talking about virtual um, displacements of energy, if you like. So this is du plus tr dsr, and dsr is minus ds. And we've just seen that that the temperature of the reservoir controls the temperature of the subsystems. And s is a that is a variable of the total subsystem. So tr is actually t as well. And now the differential and t is t is constant throughout the whole process because it's held fixed by the reservoir. So I can take D outside here like that and I have D of U minus T S. But that's the free energy. So the free energy is zero. Um, now also <coughs> D2U total is, is greater than zero, it's a concave up to a function. And so D2U plus U reservoir, which is D2U plus D2U of, of the reservoir, um, but that there equals D2U because the second derivative or the second differential of the second variation of the reservoir energy is essentially a heat capacity. And the heat capacity, uh, a one over the heat capacity, sorry, one over the heat capacity. Um, and the heat capacity, the amount of the heat capacity of a reservoir is infinite. It takes an infinite amount, of, it, it, it's so big that you can put energy into it, it doesn't change temperature. So that's why that term here is uh, zero. And, okay, um, now minus TR D2S is positive because D2S is the entropy is at a maximum, so D2S is less than zero. Minus D2S is positive. TR is positive, so that's positive. So you're just adding a positive number to a positive number, which is guaranteed to be positive. And then, again, linearity gives you that. Temperatures, and temperature's constant, sorry, as well. And also the temperature's fixed at T. So you have D2F is greater than zero. So the free energy is at a minimum. And so the, What's that saying is that Helmholtz free energy is a minimum in the equilibrium state subject to the temperature of your subsystem being equal to the temperature of the heat reservoir. Okay. Okay. Yep. Why the U of reservoir U R is zero? This color U R is zero. Uh, it's it's the change. Sorry, it's the change, not one over the heat capacity. It's the change of the heat capacity. The heat capacity is extremely large. The heat capacity of the reservoir, the definition of a reservoir is that it's so big that you can put heat in and it doesn't change the temperature. So, now you can either think of the heat capacity as being dq by dt. So it's, um, um, change dt, uh, if, if, if you change, if 1 over dq by dt is uh, is a very small number, dq by dt, dt by dq is a very um, 
small number, or you can think of it as the derivative uh, of the energy with respect to temperature, and then the second derivative of the energy with respect to temperature will be the derivative of the uh, heat capacity. And since the heat capacity is extremely large anyway, and it's certainly the, the derivative is going to be actually you know, really, it's not going to change for a reservoir. The reservoir, the heat capacity, and all, I mean, one over the heat capacity, uh, or, and all derivatives of the heat capacity are zero. It's not just by definition. Okay, so you have the Helmholtz potential minimum principle for a system in contact with a heat reservoir at temperature T. TR, the equilibrium state minimizes the Helmholtz potential over the states that have temperature equals to TR. The practical significance is that the quantity F equals U minus TS, you notice these variables refer only to the subsystem U, T, and S. No more reservoir in there. Not its surroundings. So you can calculate the equilibrium conditions purely from considering the subsystems. Okay? Um, another example, I'll skip, skip that there. Another example, uh, important one, is now you have a, a reservoir which is called a pressure reservoir. Okay? A pressure reservoir, what it does is, well, it's connected to the subsystem by a movable wall, like this. And so it exchanges volume with each of the subsystems. Okay. And again, here you have um, the same situation as before, I think. Check it out. So, um, the exchange, um, oh, okay, between the, these two subsystems can exchange anything. So the total energy is constant, and uh, the minimum um, principle means that D, means that uh, if you think of these virtual changes in energy again, then you have the differential of that, which is du minus du plus dur. But dur, the only way that the reservoir is changing its energy is by work, having work done on it. So it's minus pr dvr. Okay. But dvr is minus dv because if if the this subsystem does work on the on the reservoir by expanding into it, then dv of this is minus dvr of the reservoir. So that's that, and that has to equal zero. What that's saying is that d of u plus prv is zero. But then also we can show that in equilibrium for the isolated system, mechanical equilibrium, the pressure is uniform throughout. What that means is no part of the subsystem does work in any other part. It doesn't expand into it. So everything stops expanding or contracting. So the pressure everywhere is the same, and it's going to equal the pressure of the reservoir. The proof of that is, well, I'm not going to, um, go through it, it's just very straightforward and it mimics what I did before. You can read it yourself here. This page here um, shows that, um, that the pressure reservoir controls the pressure of both subsystems in equilibrium. So then that means we have that the energy minimum principle giving us D of U plus PV equal to zero, and that's just the enthalpy, the H equals zero. 
Okay. So that's so that uh, you have um, your sample in contact with some large object that controls pressure, and within your sample you can have anything happening. So entropy is minimized. Yeah. In the previous case, we saw that uh, we don't need to know anything about the reservoir. Mm. So that's basically because we know a relation of the total. We know what the total, the change in the total uh, entropy is, and so basically we can eliminate one of the change in entropy. Um, no, it's it's because. The, the, the total entropy is always fixed at the maximum in the minimum principle, energy minimum principle. But what's happening is that is that a change in say if there's if there's heat flow between the reservoir and the subsystem, then the heat that flows out of this reservoir goes into the subsystem, all of it, and so and so. Um, that gives a relation between the entropy change of the subsystem of the, of the reservoir and the subsystem. So we don't have to worry about the reservoir anymore because it's, it's, it's all is there the, the information is yeah is already within the subsystem. Right. Yeah. So isn't the energy the energy minimum principle in a sense less complete than the entropy maximum principle? Because the entropy maximum principle has a conservation with it that you can use. Um, that's only because you have a preference for conservation rather than um, entropy maximum. But then you need to find the maximum first and then you keep that maximum. No, it, um, oh. Um, no, if you, if you know the, the free energy then you don't need anything else. Like you, that's the fundamental relation. Yeah. So you don't need to maximize entropy. It's already done automatically. It's it's encoded in the free energy. Okay, sir. Mm. I don't understand why why is it means for the system uh, to have uh, enthalpy, I minimize mean, enthalpy. Um what the idea of enthalpy is, we'll see an example in a minute. Okay. Yeah, and that will be really clear. So after, certainly after today you'll be clear about what enthalpy means. The last one, and again it's um, because we've done this already twice, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a short way, let's just leave out some steps. But now you're, you've got a temperature reservoir and a pressure reservoir, and now you are exchanging heat and volume with the subsystems, okay? And your equations are um, that uh, the V total is VR plus V is constant, U total is UR plus U equals constant, and you have these virtual um, um, changes in entropy, in, in energy, is DU plus DUR, and now DUR is the heat that's coming into the reservoir um, plus the work that's done on it, that's that. Um, now, again, because all the heat that goes into the reservoir comes out of the uh, subsystem, you get minus TRGS, and, and the work done on the reservoir is kind of energy lost from the subsystem plus PRDV. You see how it works? You see how, why you're, suddenly we're focusing on just the subsystem? And at final equilibrium, um, T equals T is controlled by the temperature is controlled by the temperature reservoir, pressure is controlled by the pressure reservoir. So the TR to the TR turns into T, TR turns into P. And so we have that DU total is DU minus TS plus PV, which is DG. Okay. So the Gibbs, this is the Gibbs potential minimum, Gibbs free energy minimum. Yep. What does it mean uh, by temperature reservoir and pressure reservoir? So, um, so a pressure reservoir is some machine that that you can we can turn a knob 
and it, it turn the dial and it will cr create that pressure on that sample. So you are able to control the pressure. So the, the pressure is essentially large, really large. Well, I mean, you can make it anything you want. I mean, in, in, you know, in, in, in principle. Uh, so, so in principle, it can be lower than the uh, internal pressure at the substation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You can you can turn this pressure down, turn this into a vacuum, all sorts of things. As long as you do everything quasi statically. So, the uh, pressure for uh, is a boat temperature and pressure for. Yeah. So, so th this thing here is a combination of a heat reservoir and what's called a pressure reservoir. The pressure reservoir is able to change its volume because it's able to, you know, compress the object or make it expand. And the, and the heat capacity is very big. The heat capacity, yeah, yeah, yeah. The heat capacity is very big, and this one, no matter how much volume, of, how much of the uh, uh, the volume of this changes, the relative change is zero. Okay. Mm. Um, and as an, I mean, if you want, as an exercise, you can show that this in fact is true. Now, so that's yeah, the minimum principles. Minimum principle: the energy ends up um, being a minimum principle, one of potentials, depending on the particular lab laboratory conditions, depending on what's under control. Now here's a, the important meaning of free energy. So you consider a system in thermal contact with a heat reservoir, so it's just a heat reservoir. Now suppose it interacts with a reversible work source. So conservation of energy tells us that, now on here we've actually got du total, so here you got, um, actually it's not du total because there's a reversible work source inside the um, well, you know, we've got uh, a subsystem uh, connected to a reversible work source. So here is these, the DU of the subsystem, here's the DU of the reservoir, and this, and, and maybe that, that would be connected to the reversible work source, that one there, DU, the, the, the subsystem. And so conservation of energy is that. Now, do you, um, you know, assume that so suppose we want to deliver the maximum possible amount of work. So we know that every every um, process must is, is reversible. The total process is, re is reversible, but we, um, and so the the maximum delivered work DWRS uh, DWRWS is um, minus du minus dur and. Um, the only thing that's being exchanged with the reservoir is heat, so that's minus TRDSR there. And then, as before, DSR is minus DS. Again, we're focusing, we're, we're sort of dis focusing on step by step more and more on the subsystem of interest. Um, and then TR is T because the temperature is controlled by the temperature reservoir, the temperature of the subsystem. And then T is constant, etc. So we have minus D of U minus T S, which is minus D F. So what that's saying, and this is subject to the total entropy being constant, in fact, at maximum. So professor, it's constant because we didn't allow the exchange. Um, the Isolated system doesn't exchange heat with anything, and all the processes were, were reversible. So delta S total equals zero. So it's not because of the energy minimum. Um, no, because not necessarily. Here we've got uh, we, we've got a reversible work source, and we've got. Um, we want to uh, see what maximum, how much work, what's the maximum amount of work that can be delivered. The maximum amount of work that can be delivered from the system of interest, which is kept at temperature T, is uh, minus the change in free energy. But in the, in the derivation, we assume that we assume that this is true even even before including the reversible work uh, system. Yeah. So and we said that it's because. The entropy is basically constant at the maximum. 
Yeah. So it's constant both ways. In, 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 this, in this situation, we've got an extra um, object in the isolated system. And a couple of lectures ago, we, we, should, we saw that uh, maximum work is delivered when there's a reversible process, and that's when the total entropy is, is zero. The change in entropy is zero. And, oh, I see. Um, so that, that says that the entropy is constant, yeah, but we also know that in any equilibrium situation, the entropy is maximum given the conditions. Yeah. So what that's saying is that the change in Helmholtz free energy is the work delivered in a reversible process. Or it's a maximum work that can be delivered at constant temperature. So if you have an object at some temperature, um, say a gas, and you want to, and you, and you let it expand into something, and let, let it do work on something, if you, as long as you keep it, its temperature constant, then you can easily calculate the, the work that it delivers, the amount of work that it can deliver by calculating the change in free energy. All you have to do is, sub, is subtract two numbers, no integration. Um, so, this is an example, um, yeah, in fact, it's the example uh, for the monotonic ideal gas, where you start off, so, so you have a, a reservoir at zero degrees Celsius, and you have um, the final, the, the, the initial volume of this small subsystem is one litre, of this one here on the left is one litre, final volume is five litres, this initial volume is 10 litres, Final volume is six liters. Check one plus ten is eleven. Five plus six is eleven. Yeah. And you maintain. Assume that the pistons move reversibly, so meaning that there's no, there are no frictional losses. Um, and assume we've got a monatomic ideal gas in here. And um, how much work is delivered in this process? And so the free energy is given by this. There's, there's the answer to that question. Okay, so you have to find out what F naught is. Um, since uh, T and N are constant, um, T and N are constant, basically we just have, here we have F as a function of T, V, N. That's, they're the natural variables of the Helmholtz free energy, but volume, but by the temperature and N are constant, and this is a log function, so it's gonna be extremely simple. Um, F of T V N is a constant minus N R T log V. Um, um, I should say that well, at when T and N are constant, so F of so here we've got F of V. Yeah. And so the total change in Helmholtz potential is delta F one plus delta F two, uh, which is blah blah blah, and it's extremely simple. You just you just subtract the number. Okay. So, that's that. So, how is the entropy measured? So, first of all, um, there's some initial state I and some final state F. Initial entropy SI and final entropy SF. And what you want is to measure the entropy difference between these two states. And suppose that the temperature and pressure are controlled in the lab. So what you what you want is the entropy as a function of T and P. If if the final state is close to the initial state, close enough, uh, then then delta S is approximately equal to D S, the the differential, which is, which really means that in thermodynamics. Um, and in that case, if, if, if and then in that case, ds is um, ds by dt at constant pdt plus ds by dp at constant tdp. But if f is further away than that, then uh, um, and, and and the process is carried out quasi-statically along some path in the pt plane, pt plane. Um, it could be any path from i to f. Then. Uh, because S is a function of state, depends only on the difference between the initial and final, the final and initial states. 
Um, that's just the integral from the initial state to the final state of ds, which is the integral of, of that. But now ds by dt at constant p is by, um, oh, this is just taking ds by dp outside. This is ds by dp at constant t modifying dp here. Take it outside there, and you've got to put it in the denominator there. But then this here, you can, you can change to a derivative of, this is minus dp by dt here by uh, one of the, um, at, at constant s, by one of the um, identities that we learned in the first, uh, I think it was the first lecture. Um, and if you want to actually prove that, uh, then, you just note that dp by dt at constant s, you look at what's, what appears here, you've got the pressure, temperature, and entropy. So p, t, and s appear. <clears throat> now consider level curves of the entropy, s of tp. S, that means s of tp equals constant. So um, there's ds again, that has to equal zero. And ds by dt dt is minus ds by dp across the tdp, which gives you dp by dt is, is that. <clears throat> and so that's where that came from. But that is at constant, um, assuming constant <coughs> entropy. So I could rewrite that as the partial, d, partial, d, partial dp dt at constant s. So that's that. Now, that thing there, that quantity there, in fact, oh, um, out the front there, by the way, is um, ds by dp at constant t. How do you know that actually simplifies to minus alpha, d, alpha times v? Why is that? Again, the original thing appearing there was s, p, and t. You've got p and t there. Uh, this is this here is a function of p and t. So which potential, which thermodynamic potential, uh, has its natural variables as temperature and pressure? Anyone remember? Yeah. It's Gibbs free energy. So that, if you look at what's there and there, that tells you which potential to use. Use Gibbs free energy. What are you going to do? Um, well, uh, just um, just do this bit first. As a reminder, you write down the Legendre transform. So U minus TS minus minus PV. So U minus TS plus PV. And then DG is that, which is um, minus SDT plus VDP. Just as we did before, because DU, um, you know, as you, as you did several times, I think, uh, I think you did it in the tutorial. Also, DG is that, so this is just, uh, this is just we did um, in the tutorial. Dg by dt constant pdt, comparing that to that, minus s is that, v must be that, and so, and so that means that the original quantity ds by dp constant t is, is d by dp of minus c s is dg by dt. Uh, minus s dg by dt, so that's minus dg by dt, uh, which is uh, minus d2 g by dp dt, and that must equal the cross, the other cross derivative, minus d2 g by dt dp, change the order, must be equal, uh, but that's minus d by dt of dg by dp, see, dg by dp, what's dg by dp? dg by dp is v, so that's minus dt by dv at constant p. And that looks familiar. Should be familiar. That's the isothermal compressibility times volume minus alpha v. That's that. Okay. So out the front here comes minus alpha v. So um, so this process. Start off by identifying the natural variables. You 
um, find you write down the uh, thermodynamic potential that has those variables, and you're going to equate cross derivatives of that thermodynamic potential. You're going to go through a process like this to identify what the first derivatives of that thermodynamic potential are, and then you're going to start. You go to start from the original expression that you're trying to um, uh, simplify uh, that, and you get minus v alpha. What's the advantage of minus v alpha over ds by dp constant t? Can anyone tell me? What do you reckon? Why, why don't I just leave the in, um, that in, in the integral sign in, under the integrand in the integrand right there? Why not just leave it as ds by dp constant t? What's the what's the advantage of that? Well, property of material. Yeah. So what? So what? It's a property of material. So it's it's, it's extreme. It's very. It's usually easy to to measure. It's a property of the material. Ds by dp constant t. What on earth? How do you do that? You know, there's no, there's no sort of device um, that you can stick into the experiment and measure, and you have an entropy meter doing that. Right? <laughs> Doesn't exist. Professor, you have to measure something else. But isn't dt zero? Wait, where? Uh, isn't dt zero? Because we fixed the temperature, right? Where? Uh, of dp when, in the definition of dp when dp. Okay. And yes, but dp at constant dp. Okay. So can you, where we're here? here? Yeah. Um, uh, where we're there? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. that one there. Down. Yeah, this one. That? Yeah. Um, say it again. What's your question? We said that he's constant, right? No. At constant t. Um, in this derivative, yeah. that's the slope of the entropy function uh, with respect to pre in the direction of the pressure when temperature is constant. Yeah. So, and so shouldn't we make a dt there zero? Oh, this one. Yeah. Oh no, because what was what this is saying is that you now you know, remember what you have to what you have to remember is that you've got a surface in say one to three dimensional space function of two variables here you're looking at s as a function of p and t but v is uh, but actually there's like a higher um, uh, there's something linking these two you can change your perspective to to be in terms, you can describe the same thing in terms of other variables. And when you do that, other things become constant in those, as long as you're using those variables. So, the, the, like the, the, it's like, um, yeah, it's, it's because, it's because both of these are related by the Gibbs free energy, by, because, by this, this cross second derivative. It's because of that. So um, it, here, only the pressure is being kept constant. Here, the temperature is being kept constant, and yet these are equal. Yeah. Because um, you're essentially, you're um, changing variables and looking at slopes in terms of describing slopes in terms of different variables. So that's differential geometry. Yes. Yeah. So, like different directions, different slopes. So, you, you're turning, it's like you've got a graph in three dimensions and you turn the axes like that. Suddenly, one slope becomes negative, and um, you, might, you might have other axes for volume or whatever. Um, and then you, you have to describe those slopes in terms of those other variables. You, know, you can't. It'd be hard to draw this, express it visually, but the maths is clear. Okay, so the last thing, last thing I'll talk about is um, is the, the physical interpretation of enthalpy and a, a really important application of it to what's called the Joule Thompson process. So you may wonder um, out out there. 
there's a big cylinder, uh, yeah, liquid. Um, yeah, and um, it's Ekijo where all the um, people from chemistry and physics labs go and um, stock up on liquid nitrogen and um, liquid air or something. Probably liquid nitrogen. And there's a liquid helium there as well. Well, how do you liquefy air? How do you liquefy nitrogen? How do you liquefy helium? Um, well, helium, uh, you can liquefy using this process, but it's usually done with a mixture of, you start off with this process and finish it off with, a, with another process, which you won't get into. But using this process, you can liquefy um, air, for example. And Professor, why do you use a certain process and not another? <coughs> because this one works. <laughs> Um, why do you use a, a, a cigarette lighter to light a cigarette and not an ice cube? It works. <laughs> <laughs> One of them works. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. So, for a composite system in contact with a pressure reservoir, the equilibrium state minimizes the enthalpy. Um, now, the the original potential is the internal energy as a function of uh, extensive variables S and V, and the enthalpy, its natural variables are S and P. Uh, so what's happened is that in the uh, using the Legendre transform, the energy in the energy, um, the volume has been replaced by the by minus the pressure. So the Legendre transform is U minus minus PV, which is U plus PV. And so DH is DU plus PDV plus PDV. But DU is TDS minus PDV, so minus PDV plus PDV cancels out. So that's TDS plus PDP. So that's a differential of enthalpy. Now, at constant pressure and particle number, so ignoring particle number changes here, uh, dH is just TDS, uh, which is dQ, as long as the process is quasi-static, very important. You can say that equals that only for equals, only for quasi-static processes. Um, so the heat added at, at, to a system at constant pressure and constant values of all other extensive parameters, uh, besides volume and entropy, appears as an increase in enthalpy. Okay. So, without looking at your notes, can anyone think of uh, a, an extremely common physical occurrence that tells you exactly what enthalpy is? So, again, it's the heat added to a system at constant pressure, and um, but uh, volume and entropy can change, um, but and. And number of particles stays the same, but it's constant pressure basically. Hmm? Filling up a balloon. Filling up a balloon. Is that a constant pressure? Maybe. But, um, <coughs> but uh, what 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 you want is an, a, an intuitive feel for the heat no. that goes into air conditioner. Either or no. the same. Yeah, okay. So when ice turns to water, latent heat is added at constant pressure. Okay. So in the atmosphere, you put an ice, take an ice cube out of your freezer, put it um, in the sink, and it melts. Now the heat that, that, that latent heat is exactly the change in enthalpy. enthalpy. In that in that circumstance, so the heat that goes into the ice cube when it melts is exactly its change of enthalpy. So it's like um, um, it, it's 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 like the, it's the it's the amount of heat that goes into or comes out of an object if it does. Um, no pressure. No, uh, it costs the pressure, yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyway, 
So suppose that the pressure is constant and the volume changes from some initial value to some final value. Okay? And the volume goes from some VI to VF. Now, if you calculate the heat absorbed, now calculate the heat absorbed by the system. So the heat flux is a change in enthalpy. So, so the heat flux is Q is a heat that, that flows into a system between when it goes from the initial state to the final state. Um, I goes is from go, from I to F like that. So that's defined as the integral um, of dQ going from I to F. Now that integral there depends on the path that you take, um, except that. Um, if the pressure is constant, then it's just the change in this uh, between the endpoints of this function of state, the enthalpy. Okay, so this is a special case. Under these circumstances, you don't have to worry about the fact that dQ um, depends on the path, because in the paths where this happens, where we have these conditions, this is an exact integral, and uh, essentially it's just a, you just got, um, you just evaluate this function at two points, take the difference. Okay. So that's, that's what, that's, if you like, that's the, like a mathematical interpretation of this. So normally that integral there depends on the path. But under these circumstances, it doesn't. Okay. So because you can equate it to a potential, yeah, that's why it's like yeah. Otherwise, if there's no restriction on p, yeah, then it's no potential, right? Yeah, because 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 you can, the system can then absorb some heat and and, and then do some work, and it, and, you know, and then it can do and it can have the change in internal energy between the endpoints can be. Uh, it is the same, but but the amount of heat absorbed or work done can be in any combination as long as you get the same difference in internal energy. But under special circumstances, this holds. So now let's suppose you know the fundamental equation in the entropy representation. So you've got H of SPN, the natural variables, SPN are the natural variables of the enthalpy. And the volume is changing from some from initial to final volume. We've given two volumes. So um, you're given two volumes, so somehow you want to uh, entropy is difficult to deal with, okay? And you'll be, since you're given two volumes, it would be very nice to be able to get rid of this, be able to get rid of this variable S in favor of volume. But, and what permits you to do that? See, the derivative dH by dP, dH by dP is V. That there. Very nice. Okay? So now, what you need to solve this problem is you need um, the, this equation of state here. That derivative equals the volume, and, and that will be given as a function of S, P, and N. You need that equation of state, and then you invert this to give a function of S, function S as, a, uh, S as a function of V, and then you just substitute that into there, and that becomes a function of V, P, N, uh, which just mixes up with, that, with whatever is left, you simplify, you know, just mixes up, you just got a function of V, P, N. Right. So, now you have a function H, of VPN. Now the number of moles is held fixed, the pressure is held fixed, the only thing that changes is the volume. So to calculate to calculate this difference, 
when you're given that, and you're given the initial and final volumes, all you have to do is to calculate this enthalpy function at two values of volume and subtract. Them. And you've got the heat that's absorbed in that process. Okay. So, in this example, you need not only the fundamental relation in the enthalpy representation, but you also need one equation of state. <coughs> and then, because you're given that the initial and final volumes and the pressure. And this is the basis of the Joule-Thompson Joule process. So, with the Joule-Thompson process, I uh, see the the top picture from Callan, Callan chapter 6. So the idea is that um, you've got you've got a piston here and a piston here and and you've got um, you start off with The substance, uh, we say air there and air there. Some initial pressure, initial volume, initial temperature here, and final volume, final pressure, final temperature here. What is? Why are they different? What you've got here is is a kind of a. It's called a porous plug, but what it is, it's like um, maybe. Um, not foam, because foam wouldn't let air through, but something like um, if you get um, fly wire and just compact it, just um, put it over itself, um, fold it over itself lots of times and make a big sort of thick thing that, that, that thick. You have fly wire, fly screen, you know what I mean? The, um, I can't remember what it's called in, in Japanese, whatever. Um, um, and um, and then, so that's got tiny holes in it, tiny holes. And so what, you, what you're doing here is you're going to push that piston in, in that direction. And, and you're compressing that air in there. And you're pushing it through these tiny holes here. And as it's moving through these tiny holes, it's a huge mess. You know, the chaotic motion, totally irreversible course okay completely reversible but when it comes out the other side um, the pressure is going to, out here I mean obviously it's, it's, you have to do work to get it through here um, the pressure here is you, you can imagine that the pressure here is going to be less than the pressure there it's gone through this like porous plug this constriction and then the, if you start if this starts off Again, up against if this piston starts up against here, the volume is zero. You push the air through. Um, this this the, the 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 volume here increases, increases, increases until it gets to some final um, some final volume um, and you know, and some final temperature, and final pressure here. So that's that's the basic idea. You're pushing air or whatever. You want to liquefy through that, like that, and um, and like that. I mean, it's, yeah, that's like the one stage in the process. So, so the important thing to do is, is if, to to get this. So you've just got to get. You just got to uh, be clear about the starting point. So the initial volume. Uh, VI, or I should call it V left or something. V left changes from VI to zero, whereas the right hand side changes from zero to VF. Okay? So the initial step is like this, and the final step is like this. So the change in internal energy, UF minus UI, is equal to the work done by the pistons. So the work done by the 
piston on the right hand side um, is integral from zero to VF because the final the right hand volume goes from zero to VF and it's and the work is minus P, in minus P V the right hand side. Okay. I should call it the right hand side. On the left hand side it goes from VI to zero, the volume goes from VI to zero and it's minus PI dV and so they're easy integrals and a PF is uh, you can make the process steady so you don't do it roughly, you just sort of sort of get the piston and, and the, just sort of steadily push it through steadily push it through then the pressure is, is reasonably constant so then um, you get minus PF VF plus PI VI. So I'm very careful with the minus signs here. Very careful. That's why I've spelled everything out. Very careful with the minus signs. Minus PF VF plus PI VI, which equals minus PF VF minus, minus of all of PF VF minus PI VI. Okay. Okay. Now, I put that on the left hand side, so I have UF plus PF VF there, and I have minus minus, which is plus PI VI on the right hand side, and look what I get. The final enthalpy equals the initial enthalpy. This, which may seem hugely surprising, but nevertheless, it's inescapable. What's on the work done is the zero. Um, zero. Oh, I don't think I'm here. Oh, okay. Um, so, now this is an irreversible process. Highly irreversible because of this uh, galls or um, porous substance, whatever it is. Highly, highly chaotic in there. Nevertheless, the enthalpy is the same before and after. Okay. Um, so it's not true to say that the enthalpy is always constant throughout the process, but it's constant for a particular value of PI and PF. And in fact, um, well, this process with that zero and that that goes to that process there, it, it, the enthalpy doesn't change. Therefore, now this is the important thing here, this is an irreversible process and the final enthalpy is the same as the initial enthalpy. But how do we actually measure or calculate the change in enthalpy? Since the enthalpy is a function of state, we can replace the true process with a quasi-static, quasi-static, isenthalpy, that means constant enthalpy process to calculate delta H. The, that is a huge statement. This is the reason why, see, in, in, in thermodynamics, we've been talking about quasi-static processes all the time. And yet, in, we've been talking about quasi-static processes all the time. And yet, in, and yet, and quasi-static process takes an infinite long, infinitely long time. It takes a long time. How can thermodynamics be useful if, if it, if it's only, if it only talks about processes that take an infinitely long time? Because we said that the approximation is valid for s this is greater than equal to zero. If we take the process process as the limit of 
infinitely small jumps or like small jumps. But that still that still never occurs. Because the real process can be replaced by one that's quasi static and the result would be the same. Correct. But what allows us to replace the irreversible process with a quasi static process? This is a huge issue. This is the one of the main points about thermodynamics, why it's useful. States. It's, it's a function of state. So so if you know the initial state and you know the function uh, the, 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 the final state and you're talking about a thermodynamic potential or entropy. It doesn't matter what we it yeah. doesn't matter how you get between the states, whether it's fast or quasi statically, it's only the, the difference that counts, the endpoints. Right? So in real processes like in engines, like di any diesel engine, petrol engine, auto cycle, all those cycles that they study over in um, automotive engineering, right? how on earth can thermodynamics be applied to those? Because the irreversible process, you know that you, you guess, you sort of measure what the initial and final states are, you know the thermodynamic potential that's involved, and you just replace the true process with a quasi-static path, any path, that's mathematically easy to, to calculate, mathematically easy to integrate. Right? And so that's how that's why thermodynamics is useful in the real world. But don't the turbulences result in differences? <clears throat> in the end, what re what matters is that your final volume your final, um, say, number of particles is a given number. Just because there's turbulence along the way, in the, uh, in the final state, there's, um, in the real world, there's going to be some whirlpools and stuff left. In the ideal case, you've fixed those, those conditions again. So volume, number of particles, entropy, or volume, number of particles, internal energy, you fixed. So it doesn't matter how messy it was along the way, it's fixed at the end, so in that state. So the problem with engines and stuff like that is that they don't give it enough time to reach the final state in which a volume, uh, the all the expensive parameters are fixed. Well, I mean, the thermodynamic estimate of, of efficiency is, was just an approximation in that case, but you, you can see more clearly exactly where the approximations are. Yeah. Okay, so so it's a very very important point this one. So the irreversible process uh, is just replaced with a reversible one that joins the initial and final states, and you calculate the entropy, the enthalpy change along the way. So you consider H to be a function of um, T, P, N. Um, so you, you, uh, Y would be T, P, N, because of S. Oh, I see. So the natural variables of enthalpy are S, P, N. So, um, so now, what this is saying is that you get it to a form that's T, P, N, invert to get T as a function of H, P, and N, okay? And then if you do that, then DT is DT by DP at constant H, DP, DT by the H at constant P, D, H, and keeping N constant, so don't worry about the rest. And what we saw is that now the enthalpy in the, in the irreversible process is the same before and after. So that means, so that means in this quasi-static process, the enthalpy just goes around in a circle. So dH is zero, or, or maybe I'm not in a circle, but it, it, depending on what, 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 hey, what, what sort of um, diagram you're um, this would be a constant enthalpy curve. 
locus in some, on some surface. Anyway, dh equals zero. See, this dh equals zero is a dh on a path. On a path, so dh is zero. And so you have, d, so you have dt is just dt by dp at constant h dp. And now what you want to do is relate this to experimentally measurable quantities. So dt by dh, dt by dp, that constant h dp, you, what you want to do is, it, there's like a standard algorithm for reducing these things which you're going to learn next week. Give you a preview now. If you have a thermodynamic potential down here, which is held constant, you get it in as, um, as a potential being differentiated. So you use this identity that we learned in the first lecture. So that's going to be dh by uh, dp at constant t divided by dh by dt at constant p and minus sign there. To that, to that. The aim of what we're doing here is to reduce this, which looks simple, but it's not measurable. We want to, we want to um, change this to something that's measurable. So this constant h is is is, an, is a problem. So you get you bring it up like that, dh by dp, and now you use the first law or the first and second law, dh uh, dh equals tds plus bdp, dh. So dh. So this would be dh by dp. A constant t is. T dS by dP at constant T plus V. So that's that there. That goes there. And similarly, the denominator turns into T dS by dT at constant P plus zero because that's um. Um. um, um Oh, it's a constant p. That's a constant p there. So, dh. So that would be dh. So, dh equals t dS plus v dp. So dh by dt a constant p, which is what we're doing with the denominator here. A constant p is t dS by dt a constant p plus V dp by dp at constant t, which is zero. It's constant p. P is constant. So dp is zero. That's that. That's that's there. And so oh, and what we, what do we have here in the denominator? T dS by dt at constant p. What's that? It's this one here. Should recognize it. Should be automatic. You got to you got to recognize these because you got to recognize when to stop. <laughs> when to stop your calculation. You got to know the stopping condition if you're into computer science. Right? What's this one here? CP the denominator, so we've done fine. And what's uh, dv by dt constant p? Um, the bulb. Not bulb. It's one over the bulb. But what is it? No, it's the dv by dt. It's nothing to do with bulb, anything. It's dv by dt constant p. What's that? Copper. Copper. 
there are only like three or oh, three letters that we've got. Yeah, yeah, expansion coefficient. This is this is V alpha. Alpha. Yeah. Right. Okay. So you got so you got minus minus T alpha V plus V over C P in P. And so that's that DT 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 equals that dp, take dp over up to this side, dt by dp equals v on cp, t alpha minus 1. And now alpha is measurable, cp is measurable, v is a molar volume, and so we know um, the slope dt by dp, which is useful, with, uh, which we'll see in the power in a minute. Um, and this is all happening at constant enthalpy. There's a constant enthalpy surface. H is a function of T and P. Taking as if you take H as a function of T and P, um, then then you have a constant surface H, and there's a, a curve in the domain. There's there's say P along that axis and T along that axis. This curve is some T is a function of P, let's say. Along that curve, um, the enthalpy has some fixed value like that. And then dt by dp uh, is just the slope of that curve in the domain. That, the slope of that curve is given by that measurable, measurable expression there. Okay, so dt by dp equals zero, you can notice that there's a minus sign there, so this quantity here equals zero when alpha equals one on t, or alpha t equals one. On the other hand, now what, what does that mean? Why is this useful? Why does that give us something, that, well, something that's very experimentally useful? Here is when, this, when dt by dp is zero, but if dt by dp is positive, it means that if you increase the pressure, then the temperature increases. You know, I could have said that when you were in high school and you would have understood it, right? Yeah. Totally true, all right? Yeah. Here, if the <coughs> pressure increases, the temperature decreases. Ah. So there's a point. Oh, there's a what, yeah, so what, what do you think is happening? There seems to be like a, an entire curve given by alpha t equals 1, where if you're above this curve, if you increase the pressure, you're actually increasing the temperature of your gas. But if you're below this curve, it's called the inversion curve, the inversion curve. If you increase the pressure, in fact, you're decreasing the temperature of your of your gas. Now, what if you could start the gas off at a low enough, um, at, in the right sort of conditions, and 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 increase the pressure through that gauze, and and pass it through, and um, and then and then it drops its temperature, and then you put it in through again. You, again, you compress it, decrease its temperature more, and then put it through again, and again, and again, in a, in a, in a cycle. Eventually, it's gonna get so cold that it'll become a liquid, because as long as the, um, the phase diagram doesn't have any surprises, so, what that's saying, in fact, the, the, the picture is um, this one here. That's what this one is in Cowan. Cowan figure 6.4, now you can understand it. Let's have a look. Um, let's see, so on the vertical axis, we've got temperature in Kelvin. So room temperature is around here somewhere. 
was it room temperature 300 Kelvin? Room temperature um, and pressure in megapascals along here. And you've got uh, the, the curves, these solid lines here are isenthalps, the curves of constant enthalpy. T is a function of P at constant enthalpy. And here you notice that the, that the, the slope of this curve is positive, dt by dp is positive. In fact, it's positive all the way along here. And then at that point, the curve becomes negative, dt by dp uh, is negative. Here the slope is positive, and here it's, you can't see it on the graph really, but it, it's actually negative, it's concave down here that way, sloping down. And, and if you plot, if you put a dark line through all the points where the slope changes from, neg from positive to negative, you get this curve here. This is called the inversion curve. It's the locus of maxima of the isenthalps of the curves of constant enthalpy. Okay. And what that means is that as long as you have, you start off at a low enough temp, at a, well, let's see, what you did a high enough pressure. What you want is a negative slope because you want to cool the gas down. You want dt by dp to be less than zero. You want dt by dp to be less than zero because when you have an increase in pressure, then it may have a decrease in temperature. That's what you want. So you want to start off your gas at a high enough pressure and a low enough temperature, say around here somewhere, and then if you pass it through, its temperature will drop further, and you pass it around again, it drops further, pass it around again, drops further, pass it around, pass it around, pass it around, circulate it around, it liquefies. Whereas here, if you start at here, the temperature would increase. Like that, if you circulated it. If, you, if the pressure was not high enough to start with, the temperature was too high, like that. And, this, and then um, if it's here, then it'll probably, I don't know, it looks like it'll just oscillate or something. So yeah. it wants to remain out of the curve? Well, no, you want, it, you want to start the gas here, okay. So that so that when you when you put pressure when you pressurize it, yeah. its temperature drops, yeah. and then you circulate it around, and it comes down and it liquefies. But then how how are you going to bring it to that point again? It no no it's it, it decreases it, it just by a, a tube or something. Is that it's it's pressurized? So no also pressure. And so it, 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 so it, 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 it you, you just following, pump it. Yeah. You just it's, pump it. It's following the same. Yeah, it's just, okay. yeah, I don't know how you design it. It's an engineering it's problem. You design it. I mean, like it's following the same you, know, you can have a curve, you can have a rectangle. I mean, the curve here. This one? Yeah. I mean, it's following the same curve. It's, it's going, it's, the temperature is going straight down. At, um, if you're measuring the, the temperature, say, after it passes through the gauze, um, or when it's no no when when it's being fed fed in fed in fed in through the gauze just before just before the, the the porous plug just before it and then um, and you measure it and it's gone through and it comes back around the temperature's fallen yeah. and it's gone through it comes back around the temperature's fallen as long as you start here if you start here the temperature goes up so that's how that that liquid nitrogen that is made. By one of these things. I mean, there, there could be other sort of maybe more efficient processes or something, but I'm pretty sure this one's still used. All right. So now the thing is that what's um, alpha for an ideal gas? Remember, it's one over t, right? Do you remember? Did you do the calculation? You don't remember. Um, it's alpha for an ideal gas, or maybe you will do the calculation in the next assignment. Yeah, it's easy to do. 
dv by dt. Um, at constant p, so you can just get it from just pb equals nrt. And um, so I want, I want, I want um, v is a function of I want v is a function of t, so uh, t and p. So that's um, uh, v is nrt uh, on p. <laughs> right. Um, so alpha is one on t. So you put one on t in there, you just get zero. The thing is that alpha um, doesn't, for an ideal gas, is one on t for all pressures, for all values of pressure, as long as it's an ideal gas. So, so, so this. The Joule Thompson process doesn't work for an ideal gas. So what that's saying, um, well the ideal gas is flat isenthalps, so has no inversion point, uh, so you can't cool it using a Joule Thompson process. But um, every neutral gas becomes ideal at a sufficiently low density or high temperature. Uh, so this shows that throttling will work if the density it doesn't show it, it suggests if the density is high enough and or the temperature is low enough because you don't want it, you don't want the gas to be ideal you want it to be just well at least a little bit un non ideal suggest let's actually see it so what do we know we know the van der Waals gas equation of state the mechanical equation of state um, so, so let me see, I'm going to get T as a function of V and P, so um, that's just messing around, P on R times V minus B plus A times V minus B on RB squared equals T, so now T is a function of V and P. And now dt by dv, because I want to take the derivative of dt by dv at constant p, you see? You see how it makes sense? It all makes sense. If you, if you know uh, what you're aiming for, you know, then you know, if you know, if you look at what you're trying to do, you know um, that the variable, that you need to get some function, some variable as a function of particular variables. Right, then, you, then you're guided, then you know which way to go. So dt by dv at constant p is um, p on r plus, plus that. So that's easy, okay. Um, and then I'm just messing around and simplifying a little bit and I'll just get that, okay. Uh, t on v minus b minus blah, 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 blah. Okay. Now, so what I'm going to do is get what I want to do is get alpha, that's what I'm aiming for. Alpha is one on V dV by dt at constant p. It's a molar form, okay? So I need V dt by dV, okay, um, I'll get, I'll start off with, I'll, I'll multiply dt by dV by V, and so that's TV over V minus V, so multiply everything by V, one factor of V in the denominator cancels, and so alpha is 1 on v times, uh, in fact, it's 1 over that. Alpha is 1 over that. Okay. okay. So, what are we going to do now? What you need to do is identify the small parameters and expand the Taylor series. So the small parameters in this are going to be V divided by B, is it? 
V on V, no, B on V and A on RTV. So these are certainly small parameters. So I'll just rewrite the alpha <coughs> that we had on the previous page in terms of the small parameters. <coughs> oh, in fact, I could, I could just start here, there, that step there. So what I've, re what I've done is, uh, is, is found small parameters and, and just, just rewritten what I had before in, in terms of these small parameters. And I'm going to just tailor expand that. So that's in principle that it's simple. So I just have to do a little bit of technical stuff. Um, we want the inversion temperature. So that so T inversion T times the inversion temperature. The temperature times alpha equals one. So T times one on T times that in brackets the minus one equals one. So it's t times 1 on t times that in brackets, the minus 1 equals 1. t cancels, <coughs> and that implies that, that 1 equals that thing in brackets. And that thing in brackets is that equals 1. And then expand this to first order in epsilon. Expand everything to first order. So that there is 1 plus e1, epsilon 1. And that here is minus 2, and this is epsilon 2 minus epsilon 1 epsilon 2. But epsilon 1 epsilon 2 is already a second order quantity. Throw it away, we'll just keep epsilon 2. So 1 plus epsilon 1 minus 2 epsilon 2 equals 1, so that's that. So epsilon 1 is approximately 2 epsilon 2, I mean, because. Um, okay, that. So the inversion temperature is um, you put it. The inversion temperature. Um, oh, because the epsilon one, epsilon two, epsilon two involves the temperature there. A on R T V. So that's equals two A on. R T V and um, that epsilon one is B on V, so V cancels and you get T is two A on, but T is two A on R V, so it's that. So and where these are the your van der Waals parameters. Okay. So what that's saying is that if, if the temperature of the gas is less than the inversion temperature, the gas will be cooled um, and that's what you want. The inversion temperature that you get for hydrogen is 224 Kelvin. Experimentally it's 204 Kelvin. Uh, for neon it's 302 Kelvin is what you get from this. Experimentally it's 228 Kelvin so that's a Quite a big miss. The first one, this hydrogen, for hydrogen, you, you will correct to within 10%. Uh, for neon, you're miles away. And the reason is that you dropped terms in the pressure, um, which are important for uh, more massive gases or with a higher molar mass. Uh, but you can easily compute the correction, which you're not going to do. But in other words, anyway, what this is saying is that. Um, um, you can, the van der Waals approximation, well, it's okay for, um, for some gases and you know 
uh, roughly where you have to cool them down before you start the dual Thompson process if you want to liquefy them. Uh, the professor, the approximation suggests that the inversion temperature does not depend on pressure. So no matter how how big the pressure. Yeah, that's 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 that's, that's wrong. So that's wrong. So because we threw away the pressure terms here, yeah. so you should keep the pressure terms. And, um, and yeah, if you're doing it, if you're working for Professor Wada or for for Quid, and you want a job for Ed Quid, tell them you've done, you've learned about dual Thompson process. Um, and then you'd have to calculate, re redo this calculation, keeping the pressure in, probably a few more terms as well for accuracy. You use Mathematica for that. Where is the pressure to, uh, um, to So, the, the thing that we did, the derivative. Uh, I mean, in, in this in the in this van der Waals approximation here, so it's a little. Um, so let me see. P over R. P over R there. Somehow keep P over R in it. Oh, okay. okay. Mm. And then we eliminate P. We just put the definition of P. Yeah. Okay. So, what do you mean by dropping? Well, how, where, did we, where did we drop the. Uh, is it where we did the, the approximation for epsilon? Yes. We sort of. Yes. Interpreted. No, it's that's here. It's um, uh, it, it's when you rewrote. Re uh, it, it, it's this 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 step here. That step there. Anyway, that's, that's academic, that's not really, really clear. So the main point, I, I just want to re, re, um, just summarize uh, that last uh, <coughs> section on, on, on the dual Thompson process. It's, you know, it's, it's not just the, the, the dual Thompson process itself is interesting, but that's not the most important point. We, we've seen, we saw how thermodynamics is actually applied in the real world. Um, so basically, um, we chose the thermodynamic potential which best suited our purposes. And um, we, through some, through some um, well, this, this was a very important step to recognize that the enthalpy is really the, the heat that's absorbed. Um, in this, this is a, uh, uh, well, it's very, it's, a, it's, a, it's the interesting property about enthalpy. And, um, and this step here, then uh, it, all you need, this says that to know the heat absorbed, all you need to know is the enthalpy at two different states. And in our particular situation, the pressure is held constant, the number of moles is constant, and just the volume is different. So we had to replace uh, the entropy by volume. And then if you know the two volumes, you know the pressure, you know the number of moles, and you know the heat that's absorbed. And then from that, we did just a bit of analysis. Uh, the Joule Thompson process here, the surprising result that the enthalpy doesn't change between the initial and final states, even though it's a highly irreversible process. And we replace the irreversible process by, uh, by a quasi-static process with constant enthalpy at every point. And then we were able to do things like, say, dH equals zero, and we use differential analysis. Because otherwise, the thermodynamic variables are not defined. If, if everything in the sample is a mess and chaotic, then the thermodynamics isn't defined. But we still talk about thermodynamics in that situation by linking the fun, uh, functional state between the initial and final points using any quasi-static path that suits our purpose, which is easiest to calculate for example. And so we considered H as a function of T, P, and N, 
um, because that will give us what we want in the end. So we had to, uh, so that would give us, um, we would invert uh, um, H and, and T to get T as a function of H, which gives us a differential in DT. DH is zero along these quasi-static curves by diff by, by, because we chose them to be that way. And so we have that DT is, is that. Um, and then we needed to change the partial derivative of dt by dp at constant entropy into something that's experimentally measurable. More, um, and and we, we reduced it to this thing here, minus minus t alpha v plus v over cp. And so that means that dt by dp along curves of constant enthalpy must equal that. And so, uh, in fact, in this process, we are putting, we are pressurizing a gas um, and finding that its temperature drops as long as dt by dp is less than zero. And we have a condition here uh, just based on the compressibility, which, which, you know, you think, what on earth has compressibility got to do with any of this? Well, it's just this, um, the fact that the mathematical surfaces that describe these properties of matter and these substances make these relationships between seemingly um, completely unrelated quantities. So alpha, um, you know, that it creates these relationships, so alpha appears there. Um, and then, so that tells us that, uh, that, that for certain values, we can cool the gas and liquefy it. So we found the inversion curve, and we found that, well, it doesn't work for um, ideal gases, so you have to have non-ideal gases, um, and um, and we just did the just had a look at the Van der Waals gas and saw that um, you know what kind of um, inversion temperature you would get for a Van der Waals gas. Unfortunately, the pressure doesn't appear here, so that's a, that's a drawback of this analysis. But you could redo it in principle um, and leave the pressure in and see and get a P as a function of T along the, um, along the inversion curve, you know, if you wanted to, but you know, obviously we don't need to get to that sort of detail. All right, so, so, that, so today we've, got, we've covered some really important um, points. Next week we'll have the last thermodynamics uh, lecture, uh, where uh, you'll see some more applications of thermodynamic potentials and um, you know, real world applications and real world as well as you know, like the S-Lab world, the material science world, which I guess is called real. Um, and um, also, um, uh, you will see some techniques for reducing, like the standard algorithm, where, which you can crank the handle, a recipe, um, where you can just crank the handle and reduce uh, basically any thermodynamic derivative into a, a, a bunch, a combination of three uh, basic um, measurable quantities. Uh, they're called Maxwell's relations. So, so that'll be next uh, next week. Okay, it's good. So that'll, that'll do for today.